In the pantheon of the greatest video games, the Assassin's Creed series deserves its place. At the dawn of its time this franchise surprised, enticed the story and set its own standards for the video game industry. It's very sad to see where Ubisoft is currently taking the once great series. In this video you will learn everything about the plot of the best part of Assassin's Creed, according to most players. If you didn't read the title of this video, it's about the second part. Disclaimer. This video contains spoilers. More precisely, the entire video is one big spoiler. I started my acquaintance with the Assassin's Creed series from the first part. It was 2010. It was a carefree time. At that moment, my jaw dropped from the training alone. But today we are not talking about the first part, although we will get to it in the future. I completely understand why people like Assassin's Creed 2 and why many people consider it the best part of the series. If you look at the game objectively, this is the owner of the unconditionally strongest and deepest story among all parts of the series. And after the first part it was a huge leap forward. After so many years, playing as Ezio was incredibly amazing. I experienced emotions almost the same as when you, my dear viewers, like, subscribe and press the bell. I'm already silent for a few comments left under the video this is generally the dump of everything. And for multimillionaires in the description there is a link to the donation, thanks to which you can support me and my content. For many, Ezio managed to become native, along with Altair, Connor, Edward and Arno. But unfortunately, now Ubisoft doesn't give a damn about the series and they don't understand what pretending that we have already forgotten all these cool heroes in these games, slipping us donated garbage dumps with billions of kilometers of empty open worlds, without bright, interesting and charismatic heroes from with its positive and negative sides, without grey morality, without adult humor, but with a donation store. Ah, uh, okay, let's forget about the new Ubisoft games for a while and return to beautiful Florence, where we left many hours of our childhood. The plot of Assassin's Creed II is divided into two parts, the present and the past. In the present, the main character is Desmond Miles. But in the past, we have to watch his ancestor, Ezio Auditore de Firenze. Assassin's Creed II begins with the awakening of Desmond Miles in a room, although rather a cell in the building of the Abstergo Corporation, which is the brainchild of the Templars. In the world of Assassin's Creed, there is almost an eternal war between the Assassins and the Templars, where each side of this conflict is trying to completely destroy the opposing one. In short, the Templars are trying to establish a new world order with the help of the Particles of Eden, ancient artifacts of an extinct civilization, and the Assassins are trying in every possible way to prevent them. In this confrontation, the whole plot of all parts of Assassin's Creed is built. So Desmond wakes up, seeing strange symbols on the wall. All of this was painted with blood by a certain object 16 Clay Kashmarik, an assassin who was kept here before Desmond. As you can see, Desmond is object 17. Immediately, Lucy bursts into Desmond's room, freeing him and ordering him to climb into the Animus to prepare the memory of the new ancestor. In the first part of Assassin's Creed, the ancestor was Altair ibn Lahad, but in the second part the ancestor the previously mentioned Ezio Auditore de Firenze climbing into the Animus, a machine that reads a person's genetic memory and allows you to live the life of your ancestors in detail, watching the birth of Ezio. At the moment, the players will have to go through the top two training, in my humble opinion. Only the training from Far Cry 3 Blood Dragon is more ingenious. After downloading the data on Ezio, Desmond, along with Lucy, heads to the building's parking lot to escape the Templars. But as usual, things don't go according to plan. They are noticed and Lucy shows her fighting skills. Going down the elevator, the heroes see a huge hall full of animuses. And after all, this is just one hall, and one building out of many. Can you imagine how badly the leadership of Abstergo wants to take over the world? Hiding between the animuses, Desmond and Lucy face a new problem. Lucy's access card does not work for the main elevator. But Desmond, with the help of his newly acquired ego vision, not on the first try of course, but still guesses the code from the elevator that leads to the parking lot, where about a dozen guards are already waiting for our heroes, which Desmond and Lucy are closing down. After a mini victory, Lucy orders Desmond to lie down in the trunk of the gelding, where he will stay for the rest of the trip. By the way, they arrived at the hideout of the assassins. Immediately, 
Lucy, as promised, shares with Desmond the course of what is happening. The assassins need Desmond's help and they are ready to teach him everything he needs because the Templars have become too strong. To which Desmond agrees, referring to the fact that he is eager to settle accounts with the bastards from Abstergo. Lucy happily hugs Desmond and introduces herself to the rest of the mobile group of assassins Sean Hastings and Rebecca Crane. Sean is a historian and analyst, helping Desmond build an archive, more specifically a database of places, people, and events. Rebecca is an engineer and helps Desmond in the technical aspects of being in the Animus. Desmond exchanges a few words with everyone present and climbs into a new Animus courtesy of Rebecca. And here we can finally begin the story of Ezio. Periodically, during the game, Desmond will climb out of the Animus. But about this, so as not to greatly interfere with everything and everyone, I will tell further in those moments when this happens. Having connected to the Animus, Desmond, together with us, goes to sunny Florence of the 15th century to observe the life of Ezio Auditore da Firenze. At the moment, Ezio, along with the crowd, has already scored an arrow to a certain very Pizzi, who, from the words of Ezio, slandered the small family and blamed them for his crimes. In retaliation for Ezio's prank, Very throws a rock that hits Ezio's face and leaves a scar. By the way, we see the same scar in Desmond and Altair. But for now we arrange fisticuffs with various people, in the middle of which Ezio is joined by his older brother, Federico. After defeating another part of Veri's people, the latter escapes. Ezio wants to rush to catch up, but his brother stops him, pointing to the broken lip of the small, which clearly should be shown to the doctor. But our young macho did not have a penny left in his pocket, after wine and girls. Therefore, the brother offers to search the pockets of the beaten in order to collect the amount needed for a doctor's appointment. After the medical procedures, Federico insists that it is time for the brothers to return home, because the father Giovanni Auditore will be angry for their antics. But they decide first to run to the roof of the nearby church, where Ezio comes as a winner, and Federico does not calm down and drags brother to the very top of the tower, where the players will see the very scene that remained in the hearts of many who played. It is a good life we lead, brother. <sighs> the best may it never change. And may it never change us. Ezio, seeing the light in the area where his girlfriend lives, heads there to end the day quickly. In the morning, Christina's father catches the young and Ezio has to hurriedly leave the house right through the window, because Christina's father is clearly unhappy with such an event and sets the guards on Ezio, from which he almost successfully escapes. On the threshold of the house, Ezio is already met by his father, who wants to put a scolding on the small, but recognizes himself in his youth and his actions. So he just wonders if all these adventures will prevent Ezio from working and sends him to walk around Florence and bring in several documents of Lorenzo Medici, who is not at home because he went to a villa in Correggi and will return only the day after tomorrow. Ezio leaves the papers to Lorenzo's assistant, who will hand them over as soon as the latter returns. After that, Ezio returns to his father to report what happened, where he appears right during the conversation between Giovanni and Uberto. The father does not like the news that Lorenzo is not in the city, but he cannot do anything and asks Ezio to come to him later directing him to help his mother and sister for now. Sister Claudia says that her boyfriend Duccio is cheating on her, to which Ezio gets angry and goes to talk to him, and there Duccio catches with some plump hut. I don't even think it's necessary to say much about what happened next. Ezio beats all the nonsense out of Duccio, ordering him and Claudia not to be seen again. Now it's time to help the mother, Maria Auditore. She teases Ezio about his adventures the previous night, and asks for help in bringing home the paintings from the workshop of Leonardo da Vinci, who by the way will later become a very good friend of Ezio. After completing his mother's assignment, Ezio goes to collect a couple of feathers for his younger brother Petruchio. Why does he need feathers? The little one doesn't answer. Well, it's okay, he will tell later. Ezio thinks and goes, as he promised, to his father, who gives two envelopes and asks to deliver them to his companions in the city. In this task, Ezio meets quite interesting people, a man from the thieves' guild with a courtesan and a very frightened warrior who recommends leaving at night. Ezio, who does not understand anything, can only pick up the letter from the dovecot and head home, where he learns that in his absence the guards broke into the house and grabbed everyone except his mother and sister, taking them to the Signoria's palace, to prison. Ezio asks the maidenette to take his mother and sister to a safe place, and he himself heads to the palace to talk with his father, who tells his son to go home, find a hidden room 
pick up all things from there and deliver the documents lying there to Messer Uberto, whom Ezio saw a little earlier when meeting with his father. Already at home, Ezio, with the help of Eagle Vision, finds a room hidden behind the fireplace, where he takes an assassin's suit, a broken hidden blade, a sword and documents from a chest. At the exit from the house, he is met by two guards who do not want to keep Ezio alive. Having dealt with the guards, Ezio goes to Uberto, at whose house Ezio sees an unknown man in a hood, but I will tell you about him later. Uberto offers Ezio to stay with him for the night, but small refuses, and as it turns out later, he will do the right thing. In the morning, Ezio goes to the main square, where the public court of our hero's family takes place. As it turns out, Uberto does not even know about any of the documents that Ezio delivered to him yesterday. But next to him, Ezio again sees the same man in the hood. As for me, the time has come to tell you about Uberto and this mysterious man. The man in the hood is Rodrigo Borgia. He is one of the most powerful people in all of Europe, the leader of the Knights Templar or rather the Grand Master. Also, the game is often called the Spaniard. Uberto is also a member of the Knights Templar, but at a lower rank. It was he, on the orders of Rodrigo, who organized the arrest of Father Ezio and his sons. He did this in exchange for the safety and financial well-being of his family, because, a little earlier, the Medici family had deprived his family of all property. We will get to know the Medici a little later, but for now, you just need to remember all this information. Meanwhile, Uberto finds the Ezio family guilty of treason and sentences them to death by hanging. Ezio tries to intervene, but since he is still too young and can do nothing but look under skirts, he instantly loses his sword and chooses to flee, which ends up being a very smart decision. By evening, our hero runs to his house, where he meets with the Maidenetta, from whom he learns that his relatives are in her sister's house. But this house turns out to be not a simple dwelling but a place of blasphemous pleasures. Here Ezio meets the owner of this institution, Paola, Madame of the Florentine Courtesans. After making sure that everything is fine with the rest of the family, Ezio wants to go to Uberto to rid the city of him. But Paola is a smart woman and stops the young one, insisting on a couple of stealth lessons to successfully save Ezio's life after the successful completion of the mission. Paola tells how Ezio can mingle with the crowd, giving a first try to do this in a circle of courtesans. Then he goes out to test Ezio's newfound skills in practice, walking through the streets full of guards. After making sure that Ezio has mastered a rather important skill, Paola continues his training, telling how to use the crowd, or rather, how to steal. Now that Ezio has learned how to sneak up on the enemy, Paola sends him to Leonardo's shop to repair the hidden blade. Ezio, of course, does not understand how an artist can fix such a strange mechanism, but Paola insists on meeting with him. Ezio makes the right decision, heading to Leonardo, embracing with whom he shows him a broken blade and an encrypted scroll in which the principle of the blade was written, thanks to which Leo easily repairs it, and insists that as an oath of allegiance to weapons you need to cut off your finger. Ezio reluctantly agrees, but it turns out to be just a joke from Leonardo, because the early versions of the blade required this, but the new version, just like Ezio's, no longer requires sacrifice, as it has been finalized. Having dealt with the principle of the hidden blade, Leo gives Ezio a tip that if the latter finds other scrolls, then it is better to bring them to Leo for decoding. Before they can thank Leo for his help, they hear a knock on the door from the guards of Florence with orders to open it. You see, some witness told the guards that Leo was talking to an enemy of the city. Yes, we are talking about Ezio. Leonardo does not betray his friends and pretends to be a fool, but the guard is persistent and starts beating him, trying to get a confession. But he does not know that Ezio is here, who decides to test the blade getting rid of the guard and Leo escaping. It remains only to get rid of the body. But here Ezio has no problems you just need to bring the body to Leo's workshop because bodies are periodically brought to him for study. Already in a calm atmosphere, Ezio finally thanks Leo, who again insists that Ezio bring him the pages he found, thanks to which Leo can improve the blade. After fixing the weapon, Ezio returns to Paola to find out where he can find Uberto, to which he receives information that in the evening he will be in church at a showing of a new picture. Having reached the indicated place, Ezio sees how Uberto is walking along the street with Lorenzo de' Medici, trying in every possible way to devalue the significance of the influence of the latter. Having quietly approached Uberto, Ezio publicly gets rid of him, after which he makes a speech that the Auditora family did not die, because he, Ezio Auditore, is still alive, returning for the remnants of his family. Ezio wants to take them out of the city, 
heading to his uncle's villa, but Paolo once again shows himself to be an intelligent and experienced woman and offers Ezio to initially get rid of the fame of his face by tearing down posters hung around the city, bribing heralds, and the elimination of witnesses to his crimes. Having dealt with the problem of his fame, Ezio returns to the still-knowing family, telling that his father and brothers are no more. After reassuring his sister, Ezio leads her and her mother out of Florence, heading to his uncle's villa called Monteregioni. Already on the way to the villa, Veri Pizzi stands in the way of the Auditora family along with the Florentine guards, some of whom Ezio eliminates, after which Uncle Mario unexpectedly comes to his aid, from whose spectacular appearance Veri hurries to quickly run away leaving a handful of soldiers. Mario gives Ezio a sword and helps him deal with the soldiers. After the victory, Ezio, still not knowing who is in front of him, wants to give the sword to Mario, but he allows him to leave and on the way to the villa tells who he is, asking everything that Ezio knows about the betrayal of his family. After finishing his inspection of our new quarters, Mario sends Ezio to the shop for new equipment, under the pretext that Ezio has come to learn. Here Ezio and Mario have a misunderstanding. Ezio wants to take his family away, and Mario thinks that Ezio's father told him everything. But they come to a small compromise. Ezio will go get the equipment, while Mario will think about how to tell everything and give the kids some money to buy everything he needs. Arriving at the local blacksmith, Ezio buys leather greaves and a dagger from him. Next is the turn of the doctor, from whom you need to buy five servings of smelling salt. These are local first aid kits. Having bought everything necessary, Ezio goes to his uncle, who is already ready to start training the lesser, but Ezio refuses, like last time, but Mario finds an approach, asking to be trained for the sake of his mother and sister, so that he can protect not only himself, because a little earlier, he barely coped with Vary, and the road ahead is long, and it's generally not clear what the family will encounter on the way. At the arena, Mario teaches Ezio basic combat skills retreat, taunts and escapes, after which Ezio will have to demonstrate his skills in a duel with his uncle, from which he emerges victorious, thanks Mario for his help and informs that in three days he will sail to Spain, to which the uncle becomes very angry, pointing out that Ezio is a coward and just wants to escape from his problems, wishes good luck and leaves. Ezio, not understanding why his uncle took his decision so aggressively, learns from the mercenary that Veri has been annoying everyone in Monteregioni since Ezio's arrival here. Clearly wanting to apologize, Ezio heads for the villa, but Mario is not there. The warrior tells him that everyone has gone to San Gimignano to get rid of Veri. Annoyed, Ezio goes there, learning responsibility, because Veri annoys everyone precisely because of him, to which Mario says that this is not because of Ezio, because Veri is a Templar, and everyone in Monteregioni is assassins. But Ezio does not care, and he volunteers to help. After waiting for the night, Mario and his men head to the poorly guarded southern gate, and Ezio climbs over the wall, dealing with the guards with throwing knives and opens the gates to the city for Mario's people. The group is divided within. Ezio goes to distract the guards, buying Mario time to find and get rid of Veri. Having dealt with the problem, Ezio heads to the city center, where he learns from a wounded warrior that Mario has been attacked. Due to this unexpected complication, Mario has to send Ezio to find Veri alone. Reaching one of the entrances, Ezio watches as Veri, his father Francesco, Giacopo, Veri's great uncle, and Rodrigo Borgia are making plans for the near future, namely, the seizure of power in Florence. Veri remains in the city and commands the mercenaries. Francesco prepares the people in Florence for the strike, and Giacopo will reassure the citizens when it's all over. Everyone except Veri leaves and Ezio has the opportunity to get rid of him. After the successful completion of the mission, Ezio emotionally covers Veri with shit in every possible way. But Mario reassures him, saying to show respect, because he is not Veri and asks not to be like him. At Veri, Ezio finds another page of the Codex, which will later need to be deciphered from Leonardo. Returning to Monteregioni, Ezio watches as everyone begins to celebrate the victory, and thanks Ezio for his help. Mario offers to go for a walk, during which Ezio decides to continue his father's work and avenge the death of his family, going through the list of fathers, where the names of all those involved are indicated. Mario also tells Ezio about the pages of the Codex, and about some kind of prophecy encrypted on these pages. As the game progresses, Ezio will collect all 32 pages, thanks to which he will be able to see something, but I will talk about this later. Before returning to Florence, 
Mario decides to initiate Ezio into one of Monteregioni's secrets and shows him the sanctuary, a room under the villa built by Mario's great-grandfather. In it, behind bars, are Altair's armor, which he created thanks to a particle of Eden. I told you about these particles earlier in the section about the Templars. By the way, Ezio will meet one of the particles of Eden personally, but more on that later. Returning to Florence a couple of years later, Ezio enters Leonardo's shop to decipher the page of the Codex found by Veri, where he finds a manual for using a hidden blade and a diagram of an additional, second blade on the right hand. Having received a good upgrade, Ezio learns from Leo that in order to find his next target, he needs to meet La Volpe, who can help him. To do this, he goes to Mercado, an old bazaar, where he encounters a thief who steals Ezio's purse of money. Having caught up with the thief, Ezio meets with La Volpe, or the fox, who already knows about Ezio and his plans. La Volpe is the leader of the Florentine thieves and it is his job to know everything about the city and its people. Without further ado, the fox gives Ezio the money stolen from him and escorts him to the hidden entrance to the catacombs, where Francesco Puzzi will meet with his people. Pulling the handle in the form of a skull, a passage opens under Ezio's feet, where he jumps. Once inside the catacombs, an appearance reminiscent of the tombs of the Draugr from the well-known game. Ezio passes through the ruins, reaching the point where he hears the conversation of traitors who, as I told you a little earlier, are planning to seize power in Florence, and they will strike tomorrow. Now, knowing about their plans, Ezio will prevent the overthrow of power. By the way, in the same catacombs, Ezio finds the first seal needed to open the gate under the villa in order to obtain Altair's armor. The next day, Right before Mass, Ezio, mingling with the crowd, approaches the cathedral and sees Francesco Pizzi and Bernardo Baroncelli ready to strike. Ezio saw Bernardo yesterday at a meeting of conspirators in the catacombs. It was he who struck the first blow, along with Francesco Pizzi, at the Medici, Giuliano Medici, the younger brother of the ruler of Florence, Lorenzo Medici. But Lorenzo was struck by the monk Stefano, the personal secretary of Jacopo Pizzi. The conspirators successfully eliminate Lorenzo's younger brother Giuliano, but Lorenzo does not have time, because Ezio comes to his aid, protecting him from the guards and Pizzi. After dealing with the warriors, Ezio sees how Pizzi hurriedly leaves the crime scene, but decides to help Lorenzo get home in order to save his life. Having reached the right place, Ezio finally personally meets Lorenzo, but does not have time to discuss everything because the guard bursts in with the news that the Pizzi thugs are storming the Signoria Palace in order to get rid of all the Medici supporters in one blow. Arriving at the indicated place, Ezio sees how fierce battles are going on in the streets and also notices his enemy, Francesco Puzzi, on the roof of the palace. But when Ezio gets to him, he is no longer so confident in himself, and cursing Ezio, jumps into the haystack below. But Ezio catches up with him, getting rid of the conspirator. At nightfall, Jacopo Puzzi arrives in the square near the Signoria, who, as I said earlier, was supposed to calm the townspeople. But when he sees Francesco's body dangling in a noose, he rushes away, because he is well aware that their plan to seize power has failed and he is next in line to repeat the fate of Francesco. After some time, Ezio meets Lorenzo on the bridge, where at the beginning of the game Malaya fought with Veri. Lorenzo tells Ezio how the friendship between the Lorenzo and Auditora families began. When Lorenzo was six years old, he fell into the river, from where he could not get out, but one of the Auditora came to his aid. We are talking about Giovanni Auditor, Ezio's father. In gratitude for saving his life, Lorenzo gives Ezio a list of Jacopo Pizzi's allies and a code page. From Leonardo, Ezio receives an upgrade to his blade an additional blade with poison, which allows you to poison the target, getting rid of it even more quietly. Now it's Jacopo's turn, but it is not possible to find it. However, he has allies who are not rich enough to hide unnoticed. To search for them, Ezio goes to Uncle Mario to send his people in search of these very allies. Meanwhile, Malay gives the pages of the code, from which Mario reads to him about a certain prophet and two particles of Eden, but no details. To do this, you need to find more pages. Ezio now has no time to search for antiquities and he wants to leave as soon as possible, but his uncle stops him, first teaching him how to evade attacks and disarm opponents. Upon completion of the training, a messenger arrives, delivering the information that they have found Jacopo's men in San Gimignano, and Ezio is heading there. Ezio's first target is Bernardo Baroncelli he is in the local market, where he finds the end of his days, saying that they gather in the church when the time is appointed. The second target is Antonio Maffei, a priest who has taken refuge on the highest tower of the city, surrounding himself with archers. By the way, 
Antonio was also at a meeting in the catacombs, but here I am only telling you about the importance at the right time, and this priest does not have an influential role in the plot, so I will briefly talk about him. Ezio gets to him and kills him. The third target is Archbishop Francesco Salviati, one of the Pizzi conspirators. He locked himself in a local villa. Using mercenaries, Ezio clears the fields, makes his way through the wall and opens the gate after which he disposes of the archbishop, learning from him that Jacopo only comes out at night and then only to meet with the others. The fourth target is the monk Stefano, who struck Lorenzo de' Medici. He hides in his abbey, eliminating him. Ezio learns that Jacopo will have a meeting in the shadow of the Roman gods. Now it was the turn of Jacopo Puzzi himself. Ezio finds him near the church, but instead of taking immediate action, he decides to proceed to the meeting place of the Templars in order to find out more names. Having reached the ancient Roman ruins, Ezio observes the meeting of the Templars Jacopo, Rodrigo Borgia and Emilio Barbarigo. Emilio is a merchant from Venice. At this meeting, Jacopo apologizes to Rodrigo in every possible way, coming up with a bunch of excuses why their plan to overthrow the government did not work. But Rodrigo gets rid of Jacopo himself and then suddenly starts turning to Ezio, saying that he knew that Ezio would go after Jacopo and even counted on it. At this moment, the guards grab Ezio and bring him to Rodrigo, who orders the guards to finish with the assassin, but Ezio manages to escape with the help of a hidden blade. Having dealt with the remnants of the guard, Ezio ends the suffering of the still-living Jacopo. Finally done with the Pizzi family, Ezio goes to Lorenzo de' Medici to deliver the news that the entire Pizzi family is dead. Now, having dealt with all the Templars in Florence, Ezio is ready to go to Venice to get Emilio Barbarigo there, whom he saw at a meeting. But before leaving, Lorenzo gives Ezio a cloak with the Medici symbol, and while Ezio will wear it the guards of Florence will treat Ezio condescendingly. Also, before leaving, Ezio decides to say goodbye to Leonardo, but suddenly he is not in the workshop. From a passerby, Ezio learns that a nobleman paid for Leo to transport his entire workshop to Venice in order for Leo to paint some pictures. Based on the words of a stranger, Ezio will still be able to see Leo, but a little later, already in Venice itself, which is why he goes there. However, on the way to Venice, Ezio unexpectedly meets Leonardo on the road, where the latter has problems with the wheel of the cart. Ezio helps Leo by lifting the wagon so that he can make repairs and sees a strange thing inside, like a huge bat. This is Leonardo's machine his idea of how a person can fly. With this idea Leo, Ezio has yet to meet, but a little later. Now, since the friends have met, Ezio sits on the reins and together with Leo, rides along the picturesque paths of Italy. Suddenly, the riders of Rodrigo Borgia are approaching the wagon, who intend to intercept Ezio. At a fighting pace, with people always jumping on the wagon, Ezio will drive to the bridge, which is set on fire, but the heroes manage to rush over it until it crashes. Resigned to the fact that the warriors will not be left behind, Ezio gives the reins to Leo and jumps out of the wagon so as not to expose him to even greater danger. Further, Ezio is already on foot heading to Forli, where on the shore, near the ship to Venice, he meets with Leonardo. But bad luck, the ferryman says that no one will get to Venice without a pass or invitation. Leonardo has won because he was invited by a nobleman, but Ezio has problems. But Mali is lucky and he hears a cry for help from some girl who is stuck on the island. Ezio helps her and she, as a token of gratitude, organizes a trip to Venice for Ezio, inviting her to return to her home. This girl turns out to be Caterina Sforza, the wife of the ruler of Forli, the place where Leo and Ezio are now. Having learned such details, Ezio admires this mademoiselle even more. In the meantime, Ezio sails towards Venice, we will briefly return to the present to Desmond. Rebecca pulls the ladder out of the Animus, saying that a long stay in it can have side effects dementia, hallucinations, splitting of consciousness, parallel realities, and so on. To sum up, if you spend too much time in the Animus, Desmond will be able to see his ancestors without the help of the Animus. And that's why Desmond was pulled out of the Animus to warm up. Well, immediately find out if he has acquired any Ezio skills. As a test, he will climb around the warehouse and activate the facility's defense system. In the process, Desmond will have hallucinations, after one of which he will lose consciousness. At this point, he will return to the memory of Altair, the assassin from the first part of the series, where he will see how he secretly met with the girl from the Templar Order, Maria Thor. With her, the story is long, and absolutely does not affect the plot in this part of the series. So I will be brief. Maria is exactly the girl who was almost eliminated by Altair when he hunted Robert de Sable. Robert dressed the girl in his armor, and ordered Altair to wait along with the guards. And Altair, who got to the Mimic, 
spared the girl and, as we now know, got along with her in the future. I won't go into detail about all of this for now. Let's return to this topic when talking about Assassin's Creed revelations. So, in this memory, Altair runs after Maria, climbs the tower, and indulges in pleasures. Then he leaves Desmond with Maria, or rather with the unborn child of Altair and Maria. And on this very strange note, I have to stop this video, as a lot of material came out as a result. The second part will be out very soon. Most likely it has already been recorded and is being edited. Support with likes, subscriptions. Do not forget that there is also a section with comments where you can suggest your favorite story game. I don't say goodbye for long. By the way, don't forget about the bell. Thank you all.